Hello and welcome. My name is Rob Phillips. I'm from Australia and the um, University of Queensland. Many of you will know me from my visits to Shandong. So welcome to the 15th Academic Conference of Critical Care Medicine from the Shandong Pathophysiology Society. I'd like to start by apologising for not being able to join you in person, but uh, the title of this uh, presentation today has intervened and I'm caught in quarantine. But my spirit's with you and I can share my ideas. So I'd like to talk today about non-invasive ultrasonic Doppler hemodynamics in COVID-19, a multi-system disease with cardiovascular complications. So I'm sure you're aware of most of the features of the disease, but it's highly infectious. Estimates are that it may infect up to 10% of the world population. It's a pulmonary infection with cardiovascular complications and ranges in severity from asymptomatic to fatal. It's also a complex disease. It's sepsis, pulmonary, cardiac, vascular, thrombotic, immune complications, all sorts of complications associated with this disease. And unfortunately, it has persistent symptoms. Until this stage, we know that it continues with significant complications for at least three to six months. And also, there is no cure. If we look at history, it tells us a little bit about what we can expect. And in 1918, the Kansas, uh, um, the Kansas virus infected 500 million people, which was nearly a third of the world's population at that time. There were 50 million deaths, since 50 million deaths and 675, 50 million infections and 675,000 deaths in the US. They ended up with the same treatments, mask, isolation, quarantine, personal hygiene and disinfectants and limitations of public gathering. So it's an infectious respiratory tract viral infection, which we haven't seen before. 90% of patients are asymptomatic. But the COVID-19 syndrome is a thromboinflammatory process that, that initially affects the lung perfusion, but consecutively affects all organs of the body, with perhaps 5% of infections becoming quite serious. And here we see the ground glass consolidation in the dependent portion of the lung, which may involve 20 to 50% of the lung, obviously inducing syncope. And then the complications of bilateral lobo and segmental pulmonary emboli in the images below. It's common currently, and uh, there are in the estimate of 40 million um, infections glo globally, um, and it's still rising. And if we look at the national distribution, the US is uh, far in advance of India and Brazil, and China still has very modest numbers of infections comparable to the rest of the world. It's also a dangerous condition. And here we see the plot of deaths over time. And again, the gradient continues. And uh, there are over a million, 1.12 million deaths currently, and it's continuing to rise. But if we look at deaths globally, we don't see a pattern so much. US, Brazil, India, and China with still quite a few um, relative numbers of mortality. So there's no emergent uh, understanding of how the disease impacts communities. What we do know is its transmission seems to be, as they say, zoonotic, and passed from a bat to a pangolin, from a pangolin to a human and a human to a human and it's the human to human transfer that causes the most grief to us in public health. Um, let's start, and I think it's quite interesting to know that the pangolins are, are very dear little creatures, uh, inhabit a lot of Southeast Asia and Africa, and uh, there are eight species worldwide. They're anteaters, so totally harmless, and go about their business. Unfortunately, they happen to be the vector or the carrier for the um, COVID-19 virus. The presentation most commonly are fever, 82%, cough, 61%, muscle aches and fatigues, myalgia, 36%, dyspnea, 26%, headache, 12%, sore throat symptoms, low down on the 10% level. Um, the natural history of the disease is in a population we can expect 10% infection. Of those, 90% will be minor, 
10% will be severe. Of those 10% that are severe, five will have complications. And in the end, less than probably 0.5% death rate from the infection and recovery rate of 99.9%. What we do know is the outcomes vary from individual to individual. And what that says is the disease affects different people in different ways. And so what that tells us is how we treat the disease involves a precision approach to therapy and diagnosis. What is the problem? How do we treat it? So pathophysiology describes or allows us to better understand what the next steps should be. The SARS structure, I'm sure you've all seen this before. Um, it's a uh, little prickly uh, sphere that has bonding spikes which stick, stick to the SARS COVID, uh, um, the SARS um, COVID binding to the ACE2 um, spikes on the surface of the cell. Um, if we look at it here, we can see it binding to the AC, ACE2 converters, receptors. We can see how it moves into the cell, it replicates and is then released outside of the cell to go on and infect others. What's the consequence of this pathophysiology? There are two principal aspects of the infection or high, high level complication. Cardioplegia, which is cardiac dysfunction, generally mediated by cytokines, as in normal sepsis, and vasoplegia, which is the concept of the ACE2 downregulation. And this produces dysfunction of the heart and the vessels. So these are the very serious aspects of the disease in terms of its consequence. Complications, septic shock, uh, obviously in severe cases, 11%. Um, acute respiratory syndrome, acute kidney injury, disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, rhabdomyolysis, rhabdomyolysis, physician diagnosed pneumo um, pneumonia. So what we can see is that by far and away, uh, the acute respiratory distress syndrome and the septic shock are they principal risk factors or the complicating factors of COVID-19. And in terms of outcomes, most patients are dis discharged, a few die, most recover, and some are hospitalized. So we know there's no cure. So what's the therapy? Circulatory support, make sure there's enough oxygen and uh, NIV, HFNO or IMV, while um, uh, ventilation be a little bit controversial, the provision of additional oxygen to patients who are dyspneic seems intuitive. Obviously, cardiovascular support when you're getting uh, septic cardio and vasoplegia requires vasoactives, inotropes, fluids, and uh, in some instances, pharmacologic thromboprophylaxis to diminish the impact of the um, thrombosis. There are sundry experimental um, interventions and therapies, many of which are complicated and have very poor evidence, but the, the uh, research is ongoing. There's a lot of optimism about vaccines, and there are 42 candidates in clinical trials with more than 150 vaccines in preclinical trials, and yet only two are at phase, only um, a few are at phase two human trials and uh, none yet have been uh, released as a cure. So thromboprophylaxis, thrombo, thromboprophylaxis um, what we do know is there is a very high cumulative incidence of thrombotic complications of critically ill patients with COVID pneumonia. And the graph on the right shows that follow-up days in ICU has a gradually increasing number of thrombotic complications. And so there are disturbances to both the uh, vessels, the vessel wall, and to the blood itself. Uh, in ventilated patients with COVID-19 associated vasodilation, um, patients have administered uh, Researchers have administered angio, um, angiotensin II converters, which preserved BP and increased 
and um, oxygen supply and decreased FiO2. And this was without harm. So this is quite an experimental approach and is addressing the bonding of the COVID spikes to the ACE2 receptors, which pr produce um, vasoplegia. So administering angiotensin II, uh, actually vasoconstricts and acts against the ACE2 um, vaso vasoplegia. There are other observations which are uh, uncertain as to how we should use them, but the study um, from uh, Yuling Ma et al showed that uh, temperature variation and humidity may be important factors affected the co affecting the COVID-19 mortality. But again, this needs more research and understanding. Ventilation would seem, intu seem an intuitive means of me uh, managing COVID. Um, short of breath, then you ventilate the lungs. However, uh, ICU mortality has been reported with non-invasive ventilation at 80% and in mechanical ventilation, 90%. So what this tells us is that ventilation alone is not curing this um, disease or not necessarily therapeutically beneficial. So the damage, uh, there is some thesis that uh, ventilation may actually be causing damage and this damage may be related to poor ventilator calibration, inappropriate ventilator pressures, rates or volumes, or variable lung conditions of patients. Some people may have excessively inflamed and responsive uh, lungs and uh, pressure um, ventilation may cause damage to those lungs and ultimately increase mortality. Post-recovery lung dysfunction, and this is uh, one of the disturbing aspects of COVID-19, and that is um, 12 to 17 percent of ICU cases, COVID cases, treated with supplemental oxygen, um, had restrictive spirometry at eight to 12 weeks. So these are people who have probably got evolving pulmonary fibrosis. Now, we don't know how long that evolving pulmonary fibrosis will continue for or when it will stop. But what we know is at the end of th three months, these people have restrictive lung physiology, and this may impact on their lifestyle and their future life expectancy. Um, and until we know more about it, we don't know how to manage this um, evolving, potentially very dangerous aspect and complication of the disease. Um, there will be um, spirometric monitoring of these folk increasingly at home to better understand how uh, a chronic acute transfers to chronic and then the evolving stages of pulmonary fibrosis. So this will be required for us to understand the second phase of the disease, the COVID-19 recovery phase. Comorbidities have uh, been reported to play a very substantial part in the history and the outcomes of um, uh, of COVID-19. And it was very early on in the piece that uh, researchers from Wuhan identified that those patients who had pre-existing cardiovascular um, conditions did a lot worse than those who had pre-existing pulmonary conditions, which is enigmatic because it's a pulmonary infection. Surely having asthma and COPD and smoking would significantly increase your risk of death. In fact, it was cardiovascular disease, diabetes and hypertension, which imposed a more than 10 times risk factor on patients. So if they had pre-existing cardiovascular disease, they were 10 times more likely to die of um, COVID than if they had a pre-existing lung disease. So what this tells us is something about how the disease works and what it impacts. So you need to have a good cardiovascular system to survive COVID-19. The Wuhan data, as I said, um, from Dr. Shi and uh, associates demonstrated that the percentage ventilation on uh, cardiac impaired patients was 46%, while for cardiac normal patients, it was only 4%. Um, 
Invasive ventilation was 22%, or 4% for cardiac normal, and mortality was much greater at 30, um, 36%. So a 10 time mortality impost, if you've got coexisting cardiovascular disease, tells us that cardiovascular function is absolutely critical to both measure and monitor in severe COVID cases. Wuhan data was followed up again, and this was a more specific study that looked at the uh, troponin T levels as a surrogate of uh, cardiac damage. And again, what they found was if you had uh, troponin T and co uh, cardiovascular disease, you had a 70% mortality. That's 10 times that of no cardiac disease. And it's very, very high disease. So managing the cardiovascular complications of COVID would seem to be really quite critical. Now, if we look at um, natural history and we look at the incidence of cardiovascular disease by um, age, what we see is as you get older, it gets more common. And what do we find in COVID-19 cases? That as you get older, your mortality increases. So there is a very close correlation and relationship between mortality and morbidity and cardiovascular disease and mortality of COVID-19. Cardiovascular, the COVID cardiovascular syndrome, and what this does is trying to tease apart, and it's quite complex, complex, the number of different ways that the cardiovascular system can be complicated. And uh, all the way through from myocarditis, cytokine dysregulation, stress cardiomyopathy, acute um, infarctions, uh, with obstruct obstructive CAD, arrhythmias. These are all the complications that can be associated with COVID-19. And these are all um, complications which have very high baseline mortalities. Let's look at what this means from a clinical point of view. In New, New York, 95% of all ventilated COVID patients required vasopressors. So what this tells us is vasoplegia is at play in these people. And the questions are, was the vaso vasodilation because of sepsis? Were they hypovolemic because of fever and fluid restriction as they would be in a normal sepsis condition? Did they have left ventricular systolic dysfunction because of viral myocarditis or cytokine impaired myocarditis? Did they have right ventricular failure from pulmonary hypertension and positive pressure, pressure ventilation? These are all questions that need to be asked and what they are are questions that are associated with the 95% complications in these patients. The solutions are really quite simple and they are the same solutions that we apply in sepsis and sepsis management. Vasoconstrictors, fluids, inotropes and manage more carefully the ventilatory support. So these are the clinical um, focus, if you like, um, of clinical management in severe COVID patients. And if we look at that, we can understand it because we know that the blood pressure is a product of stroke volume and the heart rate and the systemic vascular resistance. Now, we know in sepsis, for example, in the early stages of sepsis, what happens is the systemic vascular resistance drops and the vessels dilate. The stroke volume increases and we increase oxygen demand and oxygen delivery. When we get to this stage and we get um, vasoplegia, the, sy the systemic vascular resistance decreases, its tone decreases and it vasodilates. The stroke volume diminishes and now your oxygen delivery drops significantly. So managing the stroke volume and the systemic vascular resistance, the cardioplegia and the myoplegia are really priority management uh, approaches for clinicians when it comes to these severe cases. And the reason we use fluid inotropes and vasoactives and why it's so important to have precision measurements of stroke volume and systemic vascular resistance is it guides our therapies precisely. And while it, we can say that systemic vascular resistance 
may drop as the uh, tone uh, diminishes and stroke volume diminishes as the um, myocardial function uh, drops. That's by no means universal. And so knowing what the stroke volume is and knowing what the systemic vascular resistance is and how it responds to fluid inotropes and vasoactives is absolutely critical to getting results in COVID. And if we look at how does fluid inotropes and vasoactives impact oxygen delivery and stroke volume, it's very clear from these images that you can significantly change folk in heart failure and vasoconstrictive or vasodilatory shock by appropriate targeting of fluids, inotropes and vasoactives. And that will change the stroke volume, the oxygen delivery and the vascular tone. What we can do also with that information once we have quantitative values for um, stroke volume, systemic vascular resistance and oxygen delivery, we can develop a set of targeted protocols adapted for each individual. And that is we can see if the stroke volume index increases when we add fluid. And if we add fluid and the stroke volume index increases, we should also get a diminution or reduction in the systemic vascular resistance and an increase in oxygen delivery. The same with inotropes. Increase the pump, the SVI, the vasodilatory effects um, of the autonomic nervous system will ensure the SVRI drops and uh, there will be an increased delivery of oxygen. So once we have quantitative measures, we now have a precision pathway to manage severe COVID patients. And in uh, recognition of the effectiveness of um, the uh, non-invasive Doppler technology for managing these severe COVID patients, the um, uh, Chinese National Health and Medical Commission of the People's Republic of China for treatment of severe coronavirus in adults and children recommended its use as a preferred technology. It's simple, it's rapid, and delivers precise guidance of patients' outcomes. At the same time, paediatric sepsis guidelines in uh, the US, UK, Europe, Canada, South America, India, India and Australia also um, advocated the use of the technology for sepsis in children. And again, it was for the same reason, preci precision management and um, precisely guided therapies. So to conclude uh, my discussion and presentation today, I think COVID-19 has been incredibly challenging globally. And it is a complex disease with a predominantly cardiovascular burden. We cannot manage COVID-19 without understanding precisely what the cardiovascular function is. COVID-19 is a lung infection which spreads to multiple systems with symptoms ranging from slight temperature to death. Respiratory support and cardiovascular monitoring to guide precision therapy are established treatments for sepsis and organ damage in serious cases. We do know that experimental treatments and vaccines are still being investigated and are ongoing. But at the moment, we have pulmonary and cardiovascular support in a precise way engineered for each different patient to make sure we achieve the best outcomes. So thank you very much um, for your invitation and uh, the time to spend time with you today and discuss this very interesting disease, which we will be learning a lot more about in the next year or two. Um, and I'm glad that I can share my experiences with you. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I look forward to next year joining you in uh, person and uh, sharing the benefits. Otherwise, have a great conference and uh, thank you very much.